In March 1864, General Sherman had been made commander of military division of the Mississippi, more commonly called the Army of the West, because it controlled all Union military operations in the Western theater. He replaced Grant when Grant was promoted to command all of the Union armies. Grant trusted Sherman, and the two worked well together. Sherman and Grant worked out an ambitious, aggressive plan to bring the war to an end. Grant would focus on General Robert E. Lee's army, centered around Richmond, Virginia. For Grant to succeed, Sherman would need to keep the Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston's army tied up, unable to reinforce Lee. Sherman's plan to achieve that was breathtaking in its simplicity and its promise of destruction. He would march his armies across Georgia and eventually to the Atlantic Ocean, laying waste to all Confederate assets along the way, including the city of Atlanta, the heart of the South. The clock was ticking. In August of 1864, the former Union commander, George McClellan, who had been fired by Lincoln, was nominated as the Democratic Party's candidate for president. His platform called for peace negotiations based on the recognition of the Confederacy's independence. It looked bad for Lincoln. The war had dragged on, there had been too many Union losses, and many in the North just wanted it over. Grant and Sherman needed to give Lincoln a clear and convincing victory to convince the people, the voters, that they would win the war if they held firm. War is politics, and politics is war. Lincoln had made clear that he would accept no peace with the Confederacy that did not both return them to the Union and require their acceptance of emancipation. Much was riding on Sherman's march on Atlanta. Sherman's forces sent out in late April of that year, moving south out of Tennessee into Georgia. They stuck with the Western and Atlantic Railroad as much as possible, their supply line back north. At places like Rocky Face Ridge and Rosaka, Sherman would repeatedly flank the rebel army sending a portion of his forces around the enemy's extreme left or right, getting behind them and forcing them to pull back to their next set of defenses. For two months, the march toward Atlanta was hard, but progress was steady. Then Sherman reached Kennesaw Mountain. Kennesaw Mountain and the smaller Little Kennesaw and other rocky hills is about 15 miles north of Atlanta. The battle began at 8 a.m. on June 27th. General McPherson's artillery opened up on Kennesaw and the Confederates fired right back. Three brigades of the 15th Corps attacked at Pigeon Hill, a small bump on Little Kennesaw Mountain. They faced Confederate General Loring's Corps. The three Union brigades had about 5,500 men attacking about 5,000 rebels. But the Confederates were deeply entrenched, and the Federals were climbing, cutting, and crawling through dense brush and steep rocky slopes. One brigade managed to overrun the rebels' rifle pits, but were stopped there. Caught between Confederate General Walker's rifles on their south and rebel cannons based on Little Kennesaw, they were being cut to pieces and had to fall back. The other brigades had similar trouble, eventually hiding behind trees and rocks and taking shots at the Confederate works, which seemed all but invulnerable. Finally, General Logan himself rode up to survey the scene, saw his men were being butchered for no benefit, and ordered them to withdraw and entrench. General Thomas, charged with carrying the main attack, had to delay an hour to give his infantry time to arrange. His cannons opened up at 8 a.m., but it was another hour before his infantry could move forward. Unfortunately for the Union troops, the Confederate units holding the center were the two least likely to fold under pressure. Generals Patrick Claiborne and Benjamin Cheatham were blooded veteran commanders 
who had seen tough fighting in prior battles and emerged victorious. They were well entrenched and supported by cannons. Colonels McCook and Mitchell attacked the hill, but they were cut down. Cook himself took a fatal wound. His replacement ordered a retreat, but many of their men were either unable to retreat or unwilling to leave cover to flee. 2,000 Union troops surrendered, while others feigned death to escape in the night. At around 10 a.m., the hot shells and wadding started a fire in the woods, and wounded Union soldiers were trapped, facing a fiery death. Then, Confederate Lieutenant Colonel Will Martin made a makeshift white flag of truce and waved it, shouting to Union troops to come and get your wounded. They are burning to death. We won't fire till you get them away. And both sides ceased fighting long enough for Union and some Confederate soldiers to rescue wounded Union troops. Once done, fighting resumed. The only success of the day was General Schofield's. While carrying out his orders to demonstrate on his extreme right, he found a place where Sherman's army could move around the Confederates. Late that night, Sherman finally agreed that this was the best strategy. Once again, he flanked Johnston's army, and once again, Johnston felt forced to withdraw to a new line of defense. Johnston continued to fall back as Union forces continued to move forward, and Sherman gathered willing rebel prisoners, deserters, by the hundreds. Eventually, Jefferson Davis relieved Johnston of his command, replacing him with the more aggressive General John Hood. The Confederate force was unhappy with the change, not liking to see politicians pulling down a commander who had recognized the importance of keeping his army in the field and alive. Johnston's policy of strategic withdrawal had delayed Sherman's army at minimal cost to his own. Hood's strategy, while more aggressive, would be no more successful and considerably more hazardous to his troops. General Hood had lost the use of his left arm during the Battle of Gettysburg and lost his right leg in the Battle of Chickamauga. He had lost none of his fight, however. As Sherman's armies approached Atlanta, Hood ordered an assault on Thomas's forces at Peachtree Creek. He lost badly, taking around 5,000 casualties to 1,500 on the Union side. On that day, July 20th, the first artillery shells fell on Atlanta. Hood prepared another attack for July 22nd, this time against McPherson's army of the Tennessee. That morning, Sherman heard reports of the Confederates abandoning Atlanta. But this wasn't a withdrawal. General Hardy, who was angry over being passed over for promotion when Hood was placed in command, made a wide swing around McPherson's flank so that he could attack from the south. But he mistimed his march, turning too early and hitting the 16th Corps head on. The 16th held Hardy off, but not without a cost. General McPherson, riding almost alone, came upon a group of Confederate soldiers. They ordered him to surrender, but he just doffed his hat and galloped off. A Confederate sharpshooter shot him off his horse. He made it back to Union lines, but he was mortally wounded. In all, the Confederates took heavier losses with almost 2,500 killed and 4,000 wounded to the Union's 500 killed and just over 2,000 wounded. But the loss of McPherson was a personal blow to General Sherman. When the battle was ended, Sherman settled himself in for a siege of Atlanta. As part of the siege, Sherman needed to cut off all railroad lines into the city. Just as rail lines had served to keep him supplied on his march to Atlanta, they now provided supplies to the city and more importantly, to Hood's army. Sherman tried several raids on the rail. The first two were unsuccessful, one resulting in the capture of Union Cavalry General George Stoneman. In mid-August, 
Sherman tried again, sending the cavalry brigadier general Hugh Kilpatrick to tear up the Confederate supply lines. After this and the other failures of the cavalry to seriously disrupt the rail into Atlanta, Sherman decided that cavalry simply could not manage this mission. He planned now to send his infantry to do the job. On August 25th, Sherman had held Atlanta under siege for over a month. He ordered six of his seven divisions, over 60,000 men, to begin moving toward the Macon and Western Railroad, the last of the supply lines into Atlanta. The Battle of Jonesboro smashed Hood's men once again to a terrible effect. After the battle, General Hood, who was still in Atlanta, feared that Sherman was about to attack the city. He suspected that the move on Jonesboro was a ruse designed to draw Confederate troops out of Atlanta. The Union forces attacked at about 4 p.m. The 14th Corps delivered the brunt of the attack, striking the Confederate line and capturing Brigadier General Daniel Govan and some 600 others. By nightfall, the Confederate line was pierced in multiple places, completely overrun. General Hardy sent a message to Hood that Jonesboro was lost and the railroad cut. He moved his corps down the railroad to Lovejoy Station, where he entrenched. That night, Hood ordered the evacuation of Atlanta. The next day, September 2nd, the city belonged to General William Tecumseh Sherman. Once taking the city, Sherman ordered the evacuation of all remaining citizens. He corresponded with Hood for help in arranging the details of their removal, so this withdrawal may be made with as little discomfort as possible. In late September, General Hood took his army away from Atlanta toward Chattanooga, Tennessee. Sherman sent General George Thomas with a part of his army to follow, harass, and ultimately destroy Hood's force. Meanwhile, the remainder of Sherman's army rested in what was left of the prized city. Sherman kept his army in Atlanta for almost two and a half months while they rested and healed. Then he continued his march to the sea. He finally cut loose from the railroad and his men were forced to live off the land. They cut a path 60 miles wide and 300 miles long, destroying everything of possible military value as they passed. Sherman wrote to Grant after they reached Savannah in mid-December. We started with about 5,000 head of cattle and arrived with over 10,000. Of course, consuming mostly turkeys, chickens, sheep, hogs, and the cattle of the country. The custom was for each brigade to send out daily a foraging party of about 50 men on foot, who invariably returned mounted with several wagons loaded with poultry, potatoes, etc. And as the army is composed of about 40 brigades, you can estimate approximately the number of horses collected. Great numbers of these were shot by my order because of the disorganizing effect on our infantry of having too many idlers mounted. Although the result aimed at was attained to deprive our enemy of them. Not surprisingly, there were many complaints about the seizures of food, livestock, and other property by the invading Union Army. And the people of Georgia would never forget or forgive Sherman for the destruction wrought in the Union's name. One of those people was Mrs. Dolly Lunt Burge, a widow who had inherited about a hundred slaves from her husband. Her plantation was about 30 miles east of Atlanta during Sherman's march to the sea. She wrote of the experience of Yankee soldiers seizing food, supplies, and slaves from her and her neighbors. Like demons they rush in to my smokehouse, my dairy, pantry, kitchen, and cellar. Like famished wolves, they come breaking locks and whatever is in their way. The thousand pounds of meat in the smokehouse is gone in a twinkling. My flour, my meat, my lard, butter, eggs, pickles, wine, jars and jugs are all gone. My eighteen fat turkeys, my hens, chickens, and fowls, my young pigs are shot down in my yard and hunted as if they were rebels themselves. Utterly powerless, I ran out and appealed to the guard. 
I cannot help you, madam, he said. It is orders. My dear old buggy horse, old Mary, my brood mare, my two-year-old mule, and her last little baby colt. There they go. There go my mules, my sheep, and worse than all, my boys. Sherman's army stripped everything it could find as it moved and continued its march to the sea. It finally reached the Atlantic Ocean at Savannah, Georgia, in December 1864. He then turned north, marching through South Carolina and North Carolina, adding pressure to Lee's army in Virginia. Trailing behind his army on the way to Savannah were thousands of free slaves. Sherman had been exasperated by these slaves, who had needed to remain near the army to stay free, but they were a drag on resources. His men traded food with the freed slaves in exchange for their work in camp. And at the same time, Sherman discouraged them from following his army. Sherman and some of his generals were accused of treating the freedmen poorly. Sherman later explained that certain hard decisions had to be made in war. Whatever the reason or excuse with regard to individual incidents, these accusations combined with Sherman's own derisive comments about black soldiers in the Union Army, served to make Sherman look more like the plundering invader described by Georgians, like Dolly Burge, and less like the liberator of Georgia's slaves. But as Sherman himself would later say, war is hell. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.